Manchester's indie rock and roll station. Excess Manchester. The Excess Manchester Long Player. An iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Excess Manchester. Hello and welcome to another Excess Long Player, a deep dive on some of the greatest albums of all time. And on this episode, it's back to the 90s with the debut album from Republica. Over the next half hour or so, you're going to be hearing from the band's frontwoman and instigator, Saffron, who's going to guide us through the making of this album, the challenges they faced and how bizarrely for a UK band they managed to break the US before the UK, something that a lot of bands in the 90s really struggled to do. So many UK bands tried to break the US and they just couldn't do it. Some brilliant stories from back in the day from Saffron and Republica still going strong after all this time. This episode is being released. You might well be listening to it in February 2024. And there's a brand new album, Damaged Gods, coming any day now. All the links for all the relevant stuff, as usual, are in the podcast description. And don't forget, if you enjoy this, make sure you like, subscribe, do all the normal stuff. Leave us a review because it helps spread the word of the show and helps me have more of these conversations with some of your favourite artists about some of your favourite albums. So let's get stuck into this. Republica on Republica with Saffron Spratling. Lovely to chat to you, Saffron. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you, Jim? Yeah, I'm really good. Exciting times for Republica. Often when I do these conversations with people about classic albums, it's all about looking into the past. But it's quite exciting that you're back making new music and we can talk a little bit about the future as well shortly. But we're going to start off looking back at the self-titled debut album from Republica. And I want to start with a quick game of true or false, if that's all right. Because when I was reading up for this interview, (laughs) there were loads of internet facts that I don't think I ever knew about you as an individual. And Uh as with everything on the internet, you never really know whether it's true or not. You you have to take everything with a pinch of salt. So the things I was curious about. So pre-Republica, you were in Starlight Express in the West End. Yes. True, right? Okay. true. True. You were in the video for Chesney Hawks, the one and only. I was. I was in the video for The One and Only with Chesney Hawks and Roger Dodge from The Who, as originally it was a promotional song for an independent British movie called Buddy Song. Brilliant. And lastly, and I think I know the answer to this one because I went back and listened to this track and I went, yep, that's Saffron. You were the lead vocals on Enjoy's dance anthem Mind Flux. Yeah, I was in a band called Enjoy, and funny you should mention them because I just spoke to them just before I spoke to you. Oh, well. As they've reformed, and they've also got a a new record out called Hidden Gems 2 on vinyl, uh, which uh, I co-wrote and sing on a track, Feelings Inside, which is out now. But um, yes, I was in the band Enjoy, and it was Enjoy and the Prodigy that we first start, I first started touring with back in the late 80s. <laughs> Very cool. I mean, obviously there's this musical performance thread running through every single one of those elements. But was in your head somewhere that you always wanted to be the lead singer of a band? You wanted to be kind of the front person of a proper, big, noisy act? Yeah, growing up, yeah, I wanted to be in Hot Gossip or be a rock star. Yes, yeah, so Arlene Phillips, who choreographed Starlight Express. Yeah, I achieved that, a part of one part of my dream. And uh, yeah, forming Republica was the second part. Awesome. So I guess, like, when you look at yourself and the other band members who all came together to make Republica, you all seem to come from very different musical backgrounds and have very different musical ideas going on. And I wouldn't say any of them sounded like Republica did eventually, which was this, I don't know how you describe it, but I guess electro-punk, I'd kind of probably describe it that way. How did you settle on that as a sound? Well, I I always knew uh, what I wanted to sound like. So I approached Deconstruction Records, which I knew from the band I enjoy anyway. And I told them I had the greatest band in the world and we were going to have lots of hits and sell millions of records. Little did they know it was all in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so I then went <laughs> I then went and had to find some band members that shared my love of the same similar types of music because I wanted to, to try and meld electronic music, obviously with my punk vocal mm. and guitars. So luckily a friend of mine introduced me to Tim Dorney from Flowered Up And then there was Andrew, who was an engineer at the time, and uh, Johnny Mel, or Johnny Glue, 
and he'd grown up with Tim and he became my guitar player. Did they all get it instantly when you kind of described your vision to them, how you wanted this music to sound? Because it wasn't something that was particularly prominent at the time. It was all about Britpop back at this stage in music. Did they understand your vision? Yeah, they did understand the vision. I mean, the main thing that uh, Link to Saw was acid house music, because um, at the time we'd all come out of the kind of acid house scene in London. But obviously previously, you know, certainly myself, Tim and Johnny, our influences all came from the same, you know, kind of early Simple Minds, The Cure, The Jam, Human League and Craftwork and, and, and stuff like that. And, and, and for me, you know, uh, sort of punk bands as well. So certainly sort of music wise, they, they kind of got it. And, and no one had tried it really before successfully. Uh, to meld the two, mm. even though in America, kind of Nine Inch Nails and stuff mm. kind of existed, but it, that was kind of more on a, a industrial sort of a harder kind of sound. I mean, you know, we we uh, kind of taught ourselves and uh, did the whole kind of uni circuit and went up and down the motorway. Mm. Um, you know, played lots and lots of little gigs and clubs and bought our own equipment, made our own studio and kind of taught ourselves, really. I mentioned Britpop a moment ago, obviously the debut album dropped right in the middle of Britpop and I kind of vaguely remember you guys getting lumped in with that amorphous blob of music but obviously what you were doing was very different did you feel like kind of waving a flag and going hang on no look we're doing something very different to everyone else over there we were so lucky that we'd had the chance we were signed by the head of RCA America so we kind of had a chance as an unknown band to go and tour in the States. And, you know, we'd had huge success over there already. So when we came back to the UK, it was great because there was suddenly this scene, you know, and Britpop, you know, as a word. So, I mean, technically music, we had we, we, we had very little to, to, to do, say, bar my Cockney kind of accent and attitude. But, yeah, it was just a great time for British music and British bands and artists, you know, to break through, really, because it was kind of smashing barriers and, and glass ceilings, uh, especially for strong women. It's really interesting that the album, you got the opportunity to tour the US and the album actually came out in the US before it did in the UK. And I think this was a time where you had massive bands and massive names that were all struggling to break the US. What kind of difference do you think that made for you? Do you think it helped you gain traction being kind of like big in the States before anyone in the UK had ever really heard of you? Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, it was the only reason. <laughs> yeah, it was the only reason because we, as I said, we were completely unknown before we went out there. You know, it, obviously it gave us uh, a, a backstory. And uh, uh, and as I say, you know, you, you brought up, it was Britpop. So, you know, we came smack bang into mm. this, 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 this burgeoning scene of British bands, which included many strong women. So it was fantastic. So, yeah, I have no problem with us being, uh, you know, in and amongst all of that. But um, certainly, you know, we stood the test of time Mm. and uh, (laughs) 30 years later, we're we're blessed to still be out there headlining festivals everywhere So, and, and to have a new record out. I was looking at the schedule on that initial US tour and... (laughs) <laughs> they rode you hard. You did a lot of gigs oh. when you're out there. And I remember seeing yeah. you, it must, have, it must have been late 90s, maybe mid 90s, playing Aston University. And I think the one thing that stood about yeah. the show then, it was like, it was pure energy. There was a lot going on. <laughs> it must have been really difficult to kind of maintain that kind of presence and energy on stage on the kind of schedule you had on that US leg. Bless you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for noticing. That. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, even the closest around you, not quite realising how hard, yeah, that bit of it is. Yes, it absolutely is very, very hard to sustain at that level because our songs are so fast mm. as well. A lot of them are 160 BPM and uh, it is a very high, uh, high energy show that we give. Um, and as a performer, yeah, <laughs> if you're, you know, you're on a 65 city day uh, tour of America and you're, you know, doing a tour uh, gig and then you're driving 10 hours to the next state and do it again the next day um, plus seven hours of interviews and go mm. to the radio station and thanking them and, yeah, and doing an acoustic and, and all the rest of it. Uh, but, you know, 
hey, it's our dream. It was everything I ever wished for, so... Was yeah. it tough when you got in the studio to kind of translate and transfer that live, spiky energy that you had on stage to bring that in the studio? Was that difficult or did it all come naturally during the recording process? Um, the thing is, I think, as I said before, because we had basically bought all our own studio sets, uh, equipment, set up our studio, we kind of taught ourselves to make the music we, you know, we wanted to make. Mm. Yeah, it was our own thing that we wanted to do. So we, yeah, so I think for any band, it's, you know, of course it's it's difficult writing one song, let alone a whole album, especially if you want it to be successful and hopefully uh, have a chance of a tour or having a hit or something like that. But, um, you know, specifically, um, you know, when we had the bare bones ready to go, Mm. we were like, oh, I think we might be onto something here. (laughs) I want to talk about a couple of the specific songs on the album, and it's, I'm going to talk about the main singles of that's all right. And I want to start with yeah. the first single, Bloke, which yeah. didn't do nearly as well, Bloke, as the follow-up singles Ready to Go and Drop Dead Gorgeous. Do you think, yeah. when you look back at it, do you think the order was right? Do you think Bloke was the perfect debut single and it laid some groundwork? Or if you had your time again, would you go, yeah. oh, let's do something else, let's try something different? Yeah, well, the other thing uh, to remember is that obviously... A lot of this, the decisions, and you do fight them, aren't, aren't yours to make. Sure. They're, they're the labels. Luckily, with deconstruction, and to an extent, RCA America, even though they're major, it was very important. And actually, our first record was actually the demo that we got signed to to deconstruction was out of this world which was a white label um which had mixes by the dust brothers who were to become the chemical brothers and justin robertson dj and uh, john peel played it mm. you know which was our dream so we'd already had like white label finals out because that was kind of you know the time of the DJs and the clubs and that's the scene we were on. So yeah, you know, putting bloke out, I think was 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 a great idea because it set the scene. You know, because you can't ever expect. And and also, I have to say, if you do have a hit straight away, it really is like um, a, you know, it could be an Achilles heel because you obviously have to have a fo- you know you have to follow it up so yeah we're so proud of 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 Bloke. you know to us numbers don't really matter because it's just you know just the fact that we were a band and we've yeah. got a record release you know you know which will enable us to hopefully get another record release that's the thing in terms of the follow-ups to bloke obviously drop dead gorgeous was a single off this album yeah. as well which ended up on yeah. the soundtrack to another cultural 90s <laughs> phenomenon it ended up in screen yeah. the the wes craven film yeah i understand yeah. that wes craven phoned you personally to ask if he could he use did. the track he did he he called me uh, i was on the tour bus in nashville tennessee and the guy from rca america was like uh, i could see him kind of flapping around it's like Catherine, you, could, you got to speak to yeah. i was like what, what who is <laughs> what and it's like it's wes craven i went Huh? I'm thinking, isn't that the isn't that the guy that like like created Freddy Krueger? And I'm like, oh, I don't like horror films. He went, just talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> I went, hi. And he went, hi. I love your song, <laughs> Drop Dead Gorgeous. I went, right. He said, I have a new movie, and your lyrics are the exact storyline. Please, can I use it? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he sent me a rough cut, which I still have. Wow. I'm sure to many Scream fans that that's probably very valuable, you know, to them. I, I don't you know, I'd ever sell it, but, but because it's probably the only one in existence. But he blessed me, he sent it to me. You know, it's kind of, okay, Drew Barrymore was getting hung, drawn and quartered in the first five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, this is definitely a horror film. But the minute I saw the phone and the mask, I'm like, oh, my God, he's done it again. He's, he's actually, you know, because I had a long chat with him because it's like the same with records. He said that he'd kind of been out in the desert. He mm. was like a pariah after Nightmare on Elm Street. And I, I didn't understand why, but he explained it to me. And, uh, and I'm like, my god that's so tragic mm. you know and it's a bit like you're only as good as your last record it's like 
I can't believe that. But he said, and he explained to me, that, how do you come up with, with more scary characters than Freddy Krueger? Like, it's like, kind of, how do you follow mm-hmm. Darth Vader? You know, because at the time, you you don't realise that that is going to be, one, successful, two, you know, become, you know, such, in, 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 in you know, in squance, in, in cult, society and uh, around the world yeah. like oh, i can't even watch it because it's so scary and i, I was like yeah I, I i and you know for him it's like it's so sad to hear it's like you know your biggest success is, for him has been his most tragedy because, because i don't know how to come up with so any but i i, I thought he's done it i knew, this is it he's done it i knew, I knew it, it in my gut I had a feeling, and I went, no, no, of course you can use it, even though I don't like horror films. Um, and we got to do the premiere in Hollywood at the red carpet and everything, and do the after show party, you know, and Amazing. David Lynch is there, you know, and no doubt. And, and um, But we weren't to know, he wasn't to know. Then suddenly it's the biggest grossing film mm. in the world in that year. And I went, you've done it, Wes, you've done it again, you know, and we gave him a hug and he couldn't believe it either. That I said, you've done it, yeah. you've done it, you know. Amazing. Again. Yeah, and it's really and still hard. making screen yeah. movies in 2023. Republic are still making music. Obviously, something's going right there. Like, uh, I mean, with, with Drop Dead Gorgeous, <laughs> I guess with that, that's about kind of a relationship yeah. going on. And it feels like this whole album has this thread of relationships running through quite a lot of the songs do you find that a rich vein of material that you write on because you didn't really do the political thing so was it conscious to kind of give the album a theme around relationships or Uh, basically uh, the other thing i said to the band was uh, basically i don't want to do love song i don't we don't do i don't do them i don't feel comfortable i don't want to do them but because my my style of writing mm. is stream of consciousness so it's a bit like Ian Jory or someone like that who, who's an idol is that I will write down how I feel about or I've experienced something you know what I mean I'm not gonna like you know feel existential and blooming you know worry about rhyming cup in cuts and subjugating one of the verbs and all this I want to express how I would normally yeah. talk you know <laughs> you know it's like like a month with my heroes is John Cooper Clark, you know, the punk poet. And it's like, it doesn't really matter because, yes, I do understand how to, you know, the art of songwriting or the art of creative writing, you know, I do understand that. I'm, I'm good at English and I know I'm good at writing, but for songs, you know, mm. you know, there's a certain way of doing it so everyone tells you, you know. But it's like, well, you know, does it, if I just change it round a little bit here and there, you know. But um, and also the other thing as well is Johnny Glue's dyslexic, so he can write a scribble or a scrawl that no one else, seemingly, so he's told me, can understand. But I understand what he's trying to say, so I, I will finish or start sentences mm. for yeah. him. So that makes sense. So a lot of the stuff. It seems back to front, but it, it's on purpose and it is ironic, even though a lot of people don't get that. They just think, oh, can't write songs properly. That doesn't rhyme because it's not. Do you know what? I was talking to Callum from the Snuts recently <laughs> yeah. on the show, and, and he said basically, oh, yeah. people who tell you how to write songs can do one because no one ever told Picasso that he was yeah. putting the nose yeah, in the wrong yeah. place. Actually, and I thought that was a great analogy. It's like songwriting exactly. is a form of expression and you should that do what does. you like with it, it should be an extension of you. Yes, that, that's exactly. I'm with the fella, I'm with the snub. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and if you think it's like all my favourite bands or singers and stuff are very individual and are original mm. because they don't sound like anyone else. People that say they got, they're not even singers, but, but, but no, because they're, 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 they're you know, no, they're cultural icons. They're in, they're in a punk or a pop group. They don't have to be Mariah Carey. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's that thing, you know. Mm, That's yeah. the whole point, <laughs> is that they're not. Pick me a highlight for you <laughs> off this album, Saffron, when you look back on it. And it could be a favourite track, but equally it could be a moment from the studio that you remember. It could be a moment from the writing process. When you think about your debut album, what's the one thing that immediately sticks out to you? Oh, gosh, they've got all those, so many. I mean, obviously, America, you know, just going there and having that opportunity mm. as an unknown band, 
and to be successful. You know, you know, you couldn't have written the script better. It's like, wow, they know who we are. We're on the radio mm. and we're on TV. And I remember a moment, and it was funny because Johnny Glue and I, I believe it, he was with Johnny Depp at the time, but they, they, I think they'd been thrown <laughs> out of a bar. But then I found out later that it was Johnny Depp's bar. I can't remember. But anyway, you know, he was just mm. our new mate called Johnny. You know, you know what I mean, at the time. And Johnny was, like, trying to get back in our hotel because he lost his key, which he does all the time. Then he was trying to drag me out into Times Square. He's going, South, South, we've arrived. I'm like, <laughs> you've lost your key again, haven't you? He goes, we've arrived. He's going, can you help my friend, Johnny? I'm like, OK, you're Johnny, Johnny. No, no, this Johnny. And th so I helped this other Johnny, who turned out to be Johnny now. And I'm like, OK. Come with us. So, all right. So, I walked out to Times Square. And it was a moment, you know, when you think of Times Square and you think the yellow cabs, you know, and there's steam coming out the, you know, the manholes and there's the lights and there's RCA America, which we're signed to, you know, going up 50 floors. And then there's a very large uh, record store chain. And we looked up and I just, like, you know, the jaw drop moment. He's like, Saf, look, just look. And the first thing I saw was like a 100-foot billboard poster of the Smashing Pumpkins, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. But next to it wow. was Republica debut album. And I'm like, oh, in life. What a moment. <laughs> in Times Square. And Johnny just went, we've arrived. And I just went, oh, Incredible. my God. Oh, we have. I said, right, you know. I said, like, come on, we'll get you yeah. locked back in. <laughs> and I said, because we've got to get on the tour bus, you know, at 7am, so come on, let's go. At that moment, 30-whatever years ago, did you st have any yeah. kind of inkling, any kind of idea that 30 years on your music would still be on films on adverts no. on the radio played at football no. did you think it would have that resonance for three decades afterwards no no you just don't it's really funny like you mentioned because it's like you know uh, i was watching the scene of, uh, you know going and going to war yeah. and i know it's a topical thing and that you know yeah you said i wasn't political <laughs> like kind of now <laughs> and it's like you know, the sad thing is that a lot of great artists, they don't realise their work is so appreciated until they're gone. But I, I think that any person's expression, whether it be art, music or, or anything they do, especially if it's, if it's with positivity and love and it's with generosity or kindness as a gift, songs are immortal or like movies, you know, they're, they're infinite mm -hmm. and they will carry on long after, you know, we're gone, I'm gone. So whether or not it doesn't really matter, well, it does at the beginning. It's very important that that matters of the band and the look and, you know, how you present yourself, but uh, to to promote your music, because mm. actually they're immortal. Songs are immortal. Uh, but you just don't know how, how long that life, in your lifetime will be, that they carry on. And so, yeah, oh God, you know, we can't, you know, we still can't believe yeah, sports around the world, you know, like, you know, from football to rugby to basketball, American football to ice hockey to start, you know, it, it's just this huge anthem, you know, and to go to stadiums and hear Ready to Go yeah. with ACDC and Queen and, you know, and, and it's just like unbelievable that people will come up to me and just go, your song means so much because, you know, mm. it's my team song. Or, you know, their season ticket holders like Sunderland, say, have been playing Ready to Go as a run-on song now for over 25 years, and they still do. And it mm. means so much to that whole city, you know, of Mackhams. <laughs> and they said we were honouring Mackhams because we got to play in the middle of the pit, and they beat Birmingham in the Stadium of Light to go up to the Premiership. And it's like, oh, it's, you know, pit invasion, Mascot firework, we're all picked up, and the whole of the stadium was singing "Ready to Go," and it was like a ghost, like because it's such a big place, like and literally, you know, hardcore crew had tears in their eyes because it was sure. such an overwhelming experience that our song had totally transcended us in every way, and that these people 
were so passionate about their football, about their team, and that our song is associated, and it's just the most incredible honour and privilege. Mm. We're constantly amazed, you know, the films and the TV and Captain Marvel, you know, head of Marvel Films chose when she go to be the music to the official trailer, you know, and it was female empowerment. <laughs> I'm like, oh my, that's quite, that's, that's, that, yeah. that's good, isn't it? Like, and they're like, oh my God, do you mean, <laughs> I hadn't quite realised how big the Marvel community is. It's, it's, it's quite a large amount of people actually. And, <laughs> and I got some lovely, beautiful messages. Some were obviously from kids. Some were obviously from maybe, you know, elderly uh, gentlemen and, and women who literally had bought wow. the first comic, you know. And they said, thank you so much. We've waited our whole life to see her finally on the silver screen. So I'm getting emotional. And now we associate wow. your song with her. Amazing you know. power of music, that. It's interesting you mentioned the, um, yes, the football that's... because I saw you during the Qatar World Cup, you were out there singing, ready to go. Hey. I forget which game it was. We, we, we did um, the Argenti- American Argentina. Oh, okay. We did, I can't remember the other one. Uh, well, uh, there were two. But, but I remember the Argentinian yeah. one because Lionel Messi was like 10 foot away from me. And I, like, apart from my eyes boggling, I, I, the, the, the roar of the crowd and to hear my song, played in all the, and, and I had mates out there in all the other stadiums and they would send me little clips that they were playing ready to go in every single stadium and I'm like oh well, how this much is of what that how much of that what, uh, Qatar World Cup and kind of being invited out there and playing to the big crowds was that putting the fire back in your belly for the band to kind of regenerate and go again oh absolutely yeah, it for me, it was so important because, you know, I don't care what people say. I will go, we'll go anywhere. I'm mixed race. I stand mm. up for equality. I stand up for the LBGTQ plus trans. You know, they supported us from the beginning. And this, this for me, it's like, yeah, you want to protest, you go to the front line because mm-hmm. then your voice might be heard. And I made sure mine was. And just the fact that I was there represented something special. And also my song here, everyone, it means so much to so many people from different parts of the world because this is about football. This is about, you know, and actually mm. Qatar is only two hours wide. So it's like, sorry, but, you know, you we talked about writing earlier and we all know, you know, if you change one word at the beginning of a sentence or the end or the word, you can make it sound divisive. Well, no, <laughs> I was going to swear there. I'm not going to. <laughs> but how many people do you think have walked across that part of that land over the centuries? Mm. Quite a lot. Okay. So I made sure that, uh, like, I got to work with the most amazing Muslim women that had makeup and that had got master's degrees and then we're excited to go and see Armand Van Buren tonight and have a good dance okay that we're allowed to uh, you know uh, to have education and were empowered I got to go and see the museums and the art installations and the souks and the local people and you know, the amazing Indian community, I don't know if you saw it, that have got the amazing like, street graffiti and uh, there's so much art and diversity there, you know, and equality. Um, yeah, it wasn't quite what Fair everyone enough. had made out. Well, <laughs> let's talk about new music yeah. and getting that fire in your belly back. First new music in 26 yeah. years. Any trepidations? Oh, was it 10? Well, actually oh, 10, right. well, sorry. Not quite as long as I thought, but still, yeah. first new music in 10 <laughs> years. Any trepidations about kind of getting back on the horse and releasing new stuff? Not at all. Not at all, because uh, we've been touring now. Obviously, Mm. the pandemic was in the middle of it all, but we actually had finished Damage Gods, the album, just before the pandemic. And then I worked as a frontline key worker as Mm. mental health on the frontline. So sadly, obviously, everyone's liberty and, and, and music were taken away. But I knew that the minute that the... Well, no, none of us knew exactly when it would be, but it was so important for us to be back on the first, one of the first, you know, festivals going, which was Pen Fest, which is an amazing festival. And, um, you know, so it was us that, you know, Razor Light and Craig David and, uh, you know, it was uh, extraordinary. Um, 
you know, t- 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 and you know, and and all the stations. Mm. You know, it was a big deal. You know, it was the first time that it, you know, a big music festival outdoors was allowed. You know, and it was so important. You know, to to carry that on, and 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 because no one knew, you know, whether we'd be able to ever play again. So since then, yeah, we, we've just been going out for leather. You know, and um, yeah, we just did a full summer of headline festivals. We even went to Serbia, we went to Novi Sad. Uh, and played at the Festival of Culture there, which was extraordinary to go to, you know, to, to the, we're so lucky yeah. to, to go to these far places and find, a, find people that know we, <laughs> what you know who we are. <laughs> and, uh, and we're in the field and there's 25,000 people. It's like, and then there's, you know, this guy, I have to say, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name, but he'd driven all the way from Prague, which is actually, quite, I think, quite a long way from Serbia, uh, to give me a gift. And it was a bottle of rum called Very Republic. Good. Have you drunk it? Is it finished yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yes. Saffron, it's been lovely to speak to you about the new stuff and the old stuff on the XS Long Player. So thanks very much for joining me. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. <laughs> Access Manchester Long Player, an iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Access Manchester. A brilliant reminder exactly how good that album is, and it is fast, frenetic, and massive. That was Saffron talking about Republica's debut album, Republica, and there's more great conversations about fantastic albums on the Excess Long Player timeline. Just scroll back, see if your favourite albums are featured, and if they haven't been done yet, maybe they'll be done in the coming weeks and months. If you've got a suggestion for an album you'd like to see covered, then why not leave that suggestion in a review on Spotify, Apple, or wherever it is you're listening. I'll have a look, and maybe we'll do it in the future. And I'll see you soon for another Excess Long Player. The Excess Manchester Long Player. An iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Excess Manchester.